that's dead on me, so it looks well. It, must it be looks good. weird. <laughs> it must be right now. Okay, I thought <laughs> you were complaining. Dead, dead. That's, that's dead on me. So yeah, it's, it's, thank you, Tilly. <laughs> well, you did lose how many pounds? Yeah, Fourteen. Fourteen. Well, there you go. So you can fit in the frame now. <laughs> <laughs> These guys are actually able to be closer. Right. It's like... Hey, everybody. I'm Rick Beato. This is Red Shell Dave Honorado. Today's topic is going to be desert island gear. We're going to talk about guitars mainly and things to use with guitars like amplifiers, foot pedals, things like that. We're going to talk about new versus old, things that you might never have heard of. So I'm going to throw it off to one of these guys. For Dave, let's start with guitars. Now I want to just say this. Dave, when I was building my studio, I've talked about this before, but I've when I was buying things, I would always call Dave because he would know, be like, Dave, I don't have a lot of money to spend. I'm buying a bunch of stuff for my studio. What do I need to get and what stuff that I don't know about that's great that doesn't cost a fortune? Well, I mean, first, I don't know, one of the first pieces of gear that comes into my head that is kind of a uh, sleeper piece of gear that I love that most people don't know about, or at least maybe it's not really recognized. Uh, I'm a huge Gibson amp fan from way back. It's, Specifically the, the the 50s and up until about mid 60s era stuff and for a long time They were considered to be sort of a Half version of the fender stuff, which was not really true at all because they were a lot of the preamps and the tube choices Totally were different, complete, right? Completely yeah. different um, They might have looked similar in, in some aspects, but that was about it um, And one of the amps that I absolutely love that they've made well actually there's there's a half a dozen But the one that always comes to mind is one called an RTV 79, which was a the first true stereo vibrato amp that was ever made and it had two separate 15 watt amps in it and basically in layman's terms it sort of had like two AC 15s in one amp wow. that had two separate transformers for each one and you had a stereo and reverb in it and that actually the, the design of the cabinet was actually a V design so each 10 inch speaker would face out and not directly straight it would be kind of angled um, and those amps just uh, sound amazing. And Where do you find those? <laughs> well, nowadays, pretty much, you know, eBay and, and radio, that kind of thing. Right um, they're not as expensive as they at once were. They're, I don't know why. I think they're kind of waning a little bit just because some people have forgotten about them and, and stuff. But um, uh, they, they, they hover between the two and $2,500 range. Um, but comparatively to, like, some of the Tweed Fender stuff, 50s Fender mm -hmm. stuff, at their bargain and and they uh, guys that used them early on that were that I know that very typical tone would be like early Joe Walsh Joe Walsh used an RTV uh, 79 on a bunch of early like mid period James gang stuff um, they distort like crazy so they're one of these amps where they're not maybe the greatest clean amp they sound good clean at low volumes but when you really dial them out that's really you kind of get like this AC 15 AC 30 Brian May really compressed gain in them with like with a Les Paul it just it just rips and they're they're very they're very uh, rare because originally they were the most expensive amp that, that Gibson made at the time and they were and they what they went with was the 345 and 355 stereo right. guitars right I was gonna ask yeah. about that and so they would sell that guitar with that amp with a special cable right yeah and it had a had a had a wide cable that went yeah. to it and um and so you could use the Veritone with it, and then you could use the stereo amp, and so and and they sound amazing. And the true vib vibrato in that amp actually does do a push pull, and so it, it really it's like a magnetone kind of has this yeah, very yeah. separated vibrato that sounds amazing on it. It's almost like a Leslie effect. And um, those amps to me were always an amp that a lot of people didn't know about them, and actually they were passed up for years because people go, oh, they're kind of ugly because they're triangular and they're <laughs> weird looking, you know. They're but weird. when you heard one that was running right, man, it was just like a glorious, you know. Well, I'll tell you yeah. of an amp that I bought because of Dave, and it's this Gibson Skylark that I have over here yeah. that is a, I want to say it's a late 50s, Dave? No, this one's actually early 60s. Early 60s. And, um, and they made yeah. many different versions of this amp. I paid probably $120 for it. I bought it on eBay, yeah. what, 15 years ago, maybe? Yeah. Dave told me get one. They have different ones with vibrato with a uh, with a tremolo a tremolo, circuit. Uh, I, a tremolo I, circuit. I have a sixty four with a tremolo circuit in it. Yeah, and it's awesome. Yeah, and these were these were basically you know Gibson's version of a vibro champ mm -hmm. or champ amp, except that these used uh, completely different tube setup, um, and they had a little Alnico 
speakers in them, and half the tone of this amp is these speakers. Yeah. Okay, so why is it that this amp never or has always worked and I've never done anything to it? <laughs> why? Well, I, well, this one's actually, it's in good shape for one, but I, they're just extremely easy circuits to work on. They're mm -hmm. very basic. But I've never um, had, I've never changed anything in it. I've yeah. used it and this thousands one, of times. This one actually has the stock tubes in it, so everything in here is original. Yeah. Um, the the yeah these these amps are very basic even if you have to work on them like the caps and stuff usually will go bad in them so you have to replace those after usually 20 years on a set of caps is about right but um these are just great little five watt I, amps and, and i've used this them. on so many recordings yeah yeah you know it's interesting that you talk about the gibson amps up until the mid 60s because i have a 64 skylark it's yeah. not as clean as that but mm -hmm. it's original tubes original speaker original caps Sounds amazing, super reliable. And then I have a 68 Gibson Hawk, which is the biggest piece of garbage I've ever owned. And when it yeah. it never, like the day I bought it, it stopped working. <laughs> and so I, I took it to an amp tech here in town. I spent 300 bucks. It needed a new transformer, a new speaker. It needed a cap job. So I was like, whatever, it'll be cool. It'll sound cool. It sounds like trash. Yeah. And when I... <laughs> It works about half the time, and when I take the back off to look at it, the original wiring, it looks like they just took the box of components, dumped it into the <laughs> chassis, and then poured some solder over it and hoped that yeah, it worked. Yeah, the series, unfortunately, uh, after about 65, uh, they changed the entire amp line to a new design, and they were trying to change the, they changed the look of them. They look even more like a Fender amp. And then, but unfortunately, they don't sound anything any better. They just sort of look different. Um, but the circuits all changed. The two uh, placements and, and types changed. And they did. They just went downhill. So it's kind of known with most vintage guys. It's kind of, it's, uh, there's a few late 60s ones that actually sound okay when they're running right. Um, but the majority of the ones I've ever owned uh, were always problematic. They never sounded as good as the earlier series stuff. Um, and they they still are kind of that way, you know. It's like uh, when you find them, they're they either work great or they don't work at all. And the ones that don't work at all are just money pits, typically. Yeah. So it's interesting, though, Dave, that you said, you talked about an old Gibson stereo amp that you that's two grand or twenty five hundred used, and yeah. then we have the Skylark that yeah. I don't know how much they go These for are, now. Uh, ones without vibrato are about anywhere from like three to four hundred bucks, and then maybe wow. one with vibrato maybe four or five. And in, in, in really that, nice that was that was that was probably one hundred and forty dollars when I got yeah. it. Yeah, like I said, it's fifteen years yeah, ago. Yeah, right, right, right. Well, and even mine, I bought four years ago, and I paid. And mine's a vibrato. Yeah, and I paid two fifty. Yeah, for mine. I mean, there's still a great deal. I mean, as far as what you're basing it on, even with new stuff, yeah, four or five hundred bucks for a vintage amp that's in good shape that work, that sounds great. And that to me, that's still. The you cool know. thing with the Skylarks to do, they literally just have one knob on them. If you have the non vibrato, it's just volume yeah. it clicks on and. The only way I run that amp is volume all the way up, and then you hit it, hit it with a fuzz pedal, and yeah. it's a little what, like an eight inch, ten inch yeah, that speaker one, in there. Um, that one's a ten. Yeah, uh, yeah. Typically, so uh, but it overloads that speaker, and you just get this ridiculously under a mic. And if you've got a good signal chain, the thing yeah. sounds huge. Yeah, on, on that's the, the cool thing I love it's about these amps. Yeah, it's um, well, and it's it's that whole kind of old. Uh, technique of like when Paige used on the first Zeppelin records, you know, he used a little, basically the same amp, but it was a Supro. Supro, yeah. And just dimed it yep. and, and ran fuzz in front of it. And then, you know, so that's awesome. Okay, Rhett, so what about you? What's your... Gosh, what, uh, go-to like Desert Island Yeah, stuff? Or, or, or things that are unusual yeah, that, that you've come across. Maybe, sleeper. Yeah. Well, I am a big fan of, you know, a couple years ago I bought a guitar from a guy, a builder named Dennis Fano. Uh, that is a company called Novo and that's it's a boutique brand and we can have the discussion of like boutique versus you know mass produced or vintage or whatever but um, you know I tour a lot I, I my main gig that's how I make most of my living is on the road and, and playing shows and so I tend to gear more towards modern stuff just because of a it's what I can afford and B it's more reliable on the road than a yeah. lot of vintage stuff so but this one guitar, man, I, I fell in love with it. And I think what's what's cool about it is the it's all pine. So it's, you know, tempered pine wood, which most people don't necessarily think of pine being a good tone wood. Most of the time it's alder or swamp ash or whatever. But this so thing it's a really light guitar. It's really light. 
it resonates really well and it might just be a, a good piece of wood or whatever but that that novo it's become my number one guitar and i have you know i've got some some really good classic guitars tellies and 335 and all that kind of stuff and that odd looking offset pink sparkle guitar has become my number one and also with the p90s i think for me p90s are if i could have one guitar to do everything with it have to be a p90 guitar because they yeah. that pickup the design and the sound sits perfectly between a single coil and a humbucker like just right down the middle and you can you know by backing off the volume a little bit you can get more of a telly bridge kind of sound on the bridge pickup and then by cranking it and hitting it with a little overdrive on neck pickup you can do the neck humbucker thing like a yeah, 335 yeah. or less paul thing i mean so for me Things that I would say, try and find, go, go play a, a Pine Telecaster or, or find a Novo that's a Pine guitar and try out a Pine wood body guitar with P90s in it because mine rips. Yeah, what I found with Pine bodies, um, I built a few Tellys of Pine and it's r really light, which is great. So it kind of resembles like a Swamp Ash kind of thing. Yeah. But to me, it actually, the notes are much more like a 335 where they have this airy mid-range kind of bump in them yeah which some people might not like but i actually think they're really alive you know they, they you can really feel them resonate yeah you know and 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 a perfect example you know because just because pine is not an expensive wood doesn't mean that it doesn't sound great and isn't a great wood to use for a guitar um you know i mean we had this discussion before about you know really rare woods and all this stuff right. but you know pine i mean that's what leo built the first telly yeah. out of and well they also you know, have the pine and, box yeah, cabinets too. Cabinets, everything. Yeah. yeah. So it's it. There is. It has an inherent uh, resonant quality to it. That it, it. You know, it's really cool. The only thing I could say about pine is from from a building standpoint that I've noticed is it's a soft wood. Very soft. Right. So yeah. you have to. You know, you kind of have to compensate for that and 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 know the limitations to, to sure. that. But outside of that, though, man, I, I mean, I've had two tellies that I've built. Uh, both of them about well, they're going on about 10, 12 years now, and I mean, I've rode those guitars hundreds and hundreds of gigs and they're fine you yeah know, they're great and and i'll tell you after a four or five hour set your back is a guess yes. right and, and right. you know <laughs> something to be said about that yeah so so my desert island guitar if uh we're, we're talking about guitars is my dan electro u2 which you've seen me play in videos which i'm going to get up and get right now <laughs> now it's not really made of wood, Dave. Is it? What's it actually made out of? Well, that pine? one's actually with uh, at least when they were built in the '50s originally, they were pine uh, center block in the middle, uh, and then around the edges, and then they're actually um, from mica. Okay. Top and back. Wait. So you go like like counter countertop. Basically, it's it's fiberboard. It's cardboard. It's basically cardboard. <laughs> cardboard top back. And then the sides were wood, is, and the block is 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 pine. Is this one? This one's all wood, though, right? No, pine. no, that's same that's, same that's design. For my, now yeah, the neck uh, on this obviously is, but is it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Originally they were pear wood, which was this really cheap wood in the fifties that they used for them. Because um, these guitars new were like, I mean, they were you know extremely cheap. And yeah. Okay, so, so the the lipstick pickups in this mm -hmm. sound phenomenal. I almost always use this for playing jazz, yeah. and I use it on the rhythm pickup. Um, occasionally I'll, I'll split the two pickups depending on what kind of sound I want, but it has incredible clarity in the mid range. When you play really complex chords, they speak, every note speaks on it. You guys have seen me play, play this in a lot of videos and I, I almost never used it when I was producing. I would use it occasionally for parts and usually yeah. for really heavy riffs. I was going to say, I remember you using it for some really like detuned stuff. Yes, I'd yeah. use it for really heavy riffs. Okay. This, the, it speaks, because of the lipstick pickups, it has a clarity that you can't get with other instruments. But yeah. Dave, why do I like the way this is set up too? The radius? Um, well, one with the pickups, the reason these pickups sound so good is because they're extremely low output. Mm -hmm. So the tone is really great. They're not, they don't have a lot of output to them, but the actual tone that they produce is really nice. Um, and originally these were lipstick tubes that they used for the pickups. When Sears and Silvertone built these guitars, they had, they used these as parts and they were real lipstick tubes. Wasn't it? They tubes. were like surplus yeah. from World War II or something Yeah, and like they, that. they had, so they started doing pickups with them. And they're, they're kind of fun if you take one of those apart and see how they're actually built. It's, it's 
a lot different than like a normal like uh, single coil strap pickup. So. And what what's um, what about with the with the metal nut here? Metal nut, same thing. They were just it was cheap. It was aluminum. You know, um, originally they didn't have gears like this, like these the shallow type gears. They just had these like cheapy little plastic button gears, um, and they didn't have an adjustable bridge, which the reissues. And and the radius on this is what 16, 18, That's, something like that. Those are like 16, 17, 18 radius. Yeah, it so plays well flat. Yeah. unbelievably well. Yeah, this is a this is a killer guitar, and I got a couple new guitars from Dan Electro that they were kind enough to send me, and they play great as well. But they have a slightly different pickup configuration. Uh, they have a, I want to say it's a P P90 maybe. Yeah, it's more like a Moserite. Like a Moserite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of them is a hollow body. So this one I got is a hollow body. It's got a whammy bar on it. And it's got a double a, a humbucker, a lipstick humbucker pickup, which sounds killer. And this is it's like a Moserite. Yeah, it's yeah. like a Moserite. Yeah. Kind of, well, yeah. And, the, and the body on this is actually a copy of a, of a Moserite yeah. celebrity model. But the neck plays identical to... Yeah, this has a 16 radius. It's super flat. ...to my other guitar, although they are using a plastic nut on it. But yeah, this graphite. is a, uh, a graphite nut. Yeah. And this is, uh, you know, obviously it's a more expensive guitar. It's got more things on it, but this is a killer playing guitar. The thing that always cracked me up about Moserites is they look like they were left out in the sun for too long. <laughs> and, and like the pickup is starting to melt. Why did... Is that just like an aesthetic thing? Or is it, well, originally, is it, if you take a Moserite, like maybe not this model, but take like a Ventures model, flip it upside down, it's a Strat just turned upside down, uh, basically. Okay. And that's how they started with Moserites. It's like semi Mosley. If you take, you know, take one of his guitars, it's basically a left-handed Strat because the horn on the bottom is longer than the horn right. on the top. Right. So it kind of, and, and even this kind of shape is a little more like that. Yeah, so he, right. just took yeah, a, yeah. he just took a Strat and flipped it over and decided, <laughs> all right. And then he put uh, this right. German curve in go. it, and he did, you know, he did a lot of different stuff with it. But um, and you know, originally these guitars never had any of this stuff in it. Now this pick guard and these knobs are kind of a throwback to that. But yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, this is these are cool guitars. I like the, the all the you know the Dano stuff. They made a lot of the double cut uh, page models, you know, style ones were just like your guitar but double cut. Yeah. Um, and of course they made and then Silverton made a ton of other guitars and, and three thirty five style ones and solid body. Jaguar Jazzmaster kind of knockoffs and that kind of thing. So, but the look, the lipsticks sound great, man. Those are always great pickups. Man, so. I really love what's happening right now in the industry with like Dan Electro is doing a great job and Eastwood Guitars too, where they're yeah. going back and reissuing like Airline and all yeah. these really yeah. cool old what were cheap, you know, Sears and and um, you know department store brand guitars. They're bringing them back, you know, and they're affordable. Like yeah. There's a there's mm -hmm. an Eastwood. It's an airline that H seventy eight. Uh, Dan Auerbach in the Black Keys yeah. plays a real one. It's like mm -hmm. a big hollow body. It's got all these crazy knobs and switches on it. Yeah. That I really want to pick up because I like quirky looking guitars. You know, especially on stage, they're eye catching. People pay attention to them, and something like this that has a real. I mean, what other guitar has a <laughs> tilted neck pickup at P90. I mean, it's <laughs> yeah. it's a totally unique design and the double lipstick. I mean, that kind of thing is so cool. And I think it's sort of breathing a breath of fresh air into the guitar industry, which in some ways has kind of been stagnant in the last 25 years. You know, people have, it's, you know, you want a new guitar, it's a Les Paul or a Tele or a Strat or a 335. And there's obviously a bunch of other brands out there, but it's cool to see these old quirky, surf rock guitars from the 60s making a comeback. Well, and I think what's cool about this stuff too is that um, most all of it is, is at a price point that anybody can afford right. it. They're all under a thousand bucks typically. Um, Univox made a great guitar back in the, the, the um, most right style guitar. Yeah, the High Flyer. Well. Yeah, the that, high was, flyer. that was not an expensive guitar. Yeah, well they re they're redoing that now. Uh, Eastwood's got the model of that. So yeah. it's, the, it's like the Cobain you know, guitar that yeah. you used. And, those were great. Um, yeah, those high The one I had was, was incredible sounding, was really light, yeah. and had massive low end to it. And, yeah. it, and it was yeah. a, I don't know, $150 guitar. Yeah, right, they, like were, they were cheap. I mean, now they're, you know, a lot more money. But yeah. but these would come out with those, and I've A beat them, and, and they're, the, a lot of, the cool thing about a lot of these new guitars is actually they do, the fret works better, they actually stay in tune. You right. know, they've they've worked out the obvious bad quirks with the old guitars. Now, and, and the, you know, there is a thing about having those guitars too with those quirks and trying to make them work. That's a that's a thing in itself. But 
you know, they're, they're actually kind of making these a little more um, forgiving as far as, you know, tuning and all that stuff. So you don't have to do all this work just to try to get it to stay in tune. They're actually, you know, all right out of the box. They're, they're good now. So, which is, uh, you know, a great thing because I, I think it should be like that, you know, just because the guitar is cheap doesn't mean that it can't, it should, it should play good right out of the box. I'm, I'm a firm believer. It doesn't take that much to, you know. Okay. So let's talk about some other things like foot pedals. Now I know that Rhett, is Mr. Pedal Board. Dave, <laughs> I've learned a ton about pedals and I bought a lot of vintage pedals that he told me to buy, including my, um, oh man, the I one that got everything. stolen that I had. Oh, I don't know. Which one? The one you sold me, the, um, the original Tube Screamer. The 808? Oh, the 81? Yeah. Oh man, that was a good one too. Somebody in some band took it out. Uh, they probably thought it was theirs. That was like that golden series too there's this one with it with a certain chip in it then that's the one. oh man that sucks <laughs> i know yeah man those are like ugh, dude those are like seven bills now <laughs> yeah thanks for telling <laughs> thanks for reminding me dave well i, I paid mean, you like 150 bucks yeah, for like, it yeah, 20 years yeah, ago what you into? Well, and and just one day i was looking where's like, where that thing it's just gone so oh, i haven't man. seen that Ken's like, I haven't seen it in three years. I was like, oh, oh man. Okay. Jeez. All right, well. <laughs> well, if you know who's got it, maybe we should go visit him. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I, w I, w I wish I did. Man, as far as pedals go, as far as uh, like sleeper gear, I just picked up, there's a fuzz pedal from a company called Jex Teles uh, <laughs> yeah. called the Canyon Climber. That is the coolest most gnarly sounding fuzz I've I've ever played. It's a reissue of an old Japanese, the, uh, the Voyager fuzz. It was another cheap, you know, plastic bodied fuzz mm -hmm. uh, that had this interesting quirk where... Oh, I think it was a K. I think it was made by K. Orange plastic style. No. Okay. I'm, I'm going yeah, we'll to... I'll find out and text you. You yeah, can put it in the video. I, but yeah. it had this interesting quirk that they've actually recreated. Jex Teles has recreated on the clone, which is... It would actually cut your volume by yeah. like a third. So even with both the fuzz and volume on the, the pedal turned all the way up, it, it'll decrease your overall output. Yeah. Now they've fixed that on the Jex Teles pedal where they put an extra op amp in it essentially to get your volume back up. But it's this super crazy, unique sounding like Velcro rippy fuzz. Mm -hmm. If you want a good example of that, um, there's a Black Keys song called Lonely Boy where the main riff of that song is that fuzz and so i got one a couple weeks ago and i'm using it on like almost all my lead parts and rhythm parts it's crazy it doesn't do it doesn't do chords like it actually doesn't really do any kind of yeah it's semi tonal like, thing yeah, it just yeah. the whole sound just falls apart but in a really cool unique way so speaking of fuzz pedals a fox tone machine was always my go-to pedal they actually went out of business. They were made, I guess, in the early 70s. Huh. They have this fuzz on the outside. They, they used to just come in black, I think, but when they got reissued, they made them in many different colors. They, they Fox, there, somebody bought the name probably about, I don't know, 15 years ago, made them for a few years, and then they went back out of business probably seven, eight years ago now. But the guy that designed the circuit uh, is the guy that owns Dan Electro or is the president of Dan Electro and they have a pedal Dan Electro makes a pedal that's sitting right over there it's called the French Toast that is a pedal that I bought for 20 bucks 15 bucks on reverb and it's supposed to be the same circuit in it yet I just got it and I haven't plugged it in to try out but uh, I've, I've owned one in the past it's similar but there's something on the, about the fuzzy outside that makes it sound better. Does it have an octave switch on it? Has it has the octave switch octave on switch it. On yeah, it. I'm going to get it. Hold on. Yeah, that, the Tone Machine was my favorite fuzz pedal in the studio for years. The, um, the re, well, originally they were black and then they were red fuzz. And they also had some purple ones. And then when they reissued them, they did them in yellow and orange and all these different ones. So this is the uh, French Toast. You can get them, I think, new for about thirty-five bucks. I said the thirty. No bucks lie. Yeah. See that? Got oh yeah, the octave, it does. Octave pedal right there. Yeah. It's got really cheap parts, but supposedly, it's the exact same circuit. So, and it's small, which is good for your pedal board. So that, as far as fuzz pedals, I'm a huge 
huge fuzz fan. I have a lot of different fuzz pedals. That's probably my favorite one of all time. Uh, Dave? Say my favorite would be, um, it's kind of a three-way tie. The, a, a really good original Fox uh, is a great one. Um, the original Orange Knob Univox Super Fuzz, oh, yeah. to me that's that's still the greatest one and that's the one everybody's trying to really cop because it, it has the octave in it. Mm -hmm. It's I, Live at Leeds who Anytime you see Pete Townsend, when he kicks in the he hits that thing and it goes over the top. That's what he's hitting. So that, to me, was always the greatest. Those have been thing. hard to find for years. Well, I, 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 even in the 90s, Dave. Here's, when, a, here's a great alternative. They were for okay. a long time. There's a company called Watson okay. who makes one, which I bought. I have an original and I have the reissue. Really? They are identical. They built them wow. into the same case. The only okay. thing that changed was it doesn't have the big plastic thing. It just has a normal AV, you know. Wait, they're going to get my phone switch. Yeah, I gotta look this up. Yeah, it's a Wat a Watson, and it's um it's their Super Fuzz knockoff. And I can tell you, a being I love Super right Fuzz. next right next to each other, you can't tell the difference. And I mean, I've I've owned I don't know a dozen of the original Super Fuzzes. Most of them were all the same. They were you know some they weren't always the same exact. They were parts. very easy to break though. Yes, they were. They were not known for their for their you know, <laughs> roadworthiness. Um, uh, you know, because originally they were cheap. Univox was, they, that was cheap stuff, yeah. you know, so. Um, and well, how did they get the circuit so right on that? I don't know, but whoever, whatever they sourced the parts from or whoever they did, or if they if they reverse engineered them and actually made some parts for it, I don't know, but it's it's dead on. And I mean, I can tell you, I've put, like I said, both of them, AB, you know, through high watts, super leads, flat out with, it's it's identical. There is no difference. And how much is it, one of the watts? Um, I, the one I got, I got about, Three years ago, and uh, it was like uh, two and a quarter. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, well worth it. Built like a tank. I mean, it's they're great. Look them up. They're use one on reverb for 115. Yeah. I'm gonna save that. For yeah, that one. And okay, so wait. So what's your what's your third one? Because you have the, uh, the, the third one. Fuzz and the fox. Okay, the third one is actually kind of a weird one because it's really not. It was never intended to be a fuzz pedal, but it's the <laughs> best fuzz pedal ever. Is a uh, Wem copycat tape delay which was made in England in the early 60s. Um, David Gilmore used one for a while. Uh, he also used some other things like a Benson and some other delays. But this one is just a tube tape delay, a okay. loop delay, like an Echoplex. Right. With, and it has about four or five heads on it. It's about this big. It's about the size of a little, maybe small case. Uh, it's got three preamp tubes in it and a couple of push buttons in it. And basically what you do with this is you just run your guitar into it, run the thing flat out, and then run it in something else. And it's it's the most glorious thing I've ever heard in my life. And they're, the company that made them, it was um, Wem Copycat, W-E-M. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They made PA systems and amplifiers in England. I remember that company. Yeah. I remember that company. A Wem Copycat, they were also sold under the Guild uh, label here in the States, Guild in the 60s. Um, labeled them and they were but they were called copycat uh, and you want the tube version you don't want the solid state one the tube one is the one and they were made I would say probably 61 to about 66 maybe 65 with the tubes uh, early ones are kind of cream and um, turquoise Tolex cover. Can you find these now? They're tough but they're around you know um, and they, the good thing about them is the delay in them sucked so right. you so really <laughs> You know what they were. If built there for. were any around, yeah. there aren't going to be after this. Well, All right. Speaking of really odd, cheap pieces of gear that sound great, this is an old DoD Bifet preamp pedal. Now I was looking for a preamp pedal. This is probably twenty some odd years ago or so, uh, when I was playing in my band. I wanted something that would boost the sound and let me get over the band with my solos. I mean, I'd already have gain, but I wanted something to give it an extra kick. And I actually asked Dave, and he said, you should get one of these Bifet preamps. And the thing that's great about it is not only does it gain the tone, the sound up a lot, I don't know how many dB gain it is. Oh, you can get like probably 15 dB. Yeah, it, yeah. The, the battery never goes dead. I swear to God, I used it every day, and I think I change the battery once every five years. But the tone control on it is incredibly responsive. Yeah. And how much do you think a pedal like this would go for now? I used to buy them for 20 bucks. I see them now, they're about $75. 
and Still, worth that's, every penny. But yeah, people don't people bad, don't man. know about this. Right? No, they, they they get written off as is kind of being cheeser pedals because they weren't expensive new. And, yeah, and they and the switches on them are kind of notorious for going bad. Those little flat switches. Although I've never had one fail. No, but this, I see people all the time go, "Oh, I've had a ton of those and they always break." This thing works. I used one for ten well. years heavily. Never had a problem. Yeah. So. Um, but yeah, without a doubt, anytime I see one under hundred bucks, I buy it. Buy Fet FX10. Great preamp. Old old great, school. Great boost. Boost pedal. Yeah. No, you brought up the battery thing, and that's an interesting discussion. There's a, a company called Vertex Effects that makes a um, a power supply for your pedal board that looks like a normal. I'm thinking about getting one to run my fuzzes on. It looks like a normal power supply that has you know the nine volt cables running out of it. But it's, it has a little screw that you just pop the top off, and yep. it's just slots for 9-volt batteries. Yeah. So you are running your pedals off of 9 volts, but instead wow. of having, when they die, you don't have to pull them off your board and take the back off of it. it has little you know indicator lights on them, so when they do die, you just it's a thumb screw. You take top off, pop a new 9-volt in that one slot, and I think it's like 6 or maybe 4 or 6 yeah, slots. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's Wait, 4. Wait, so when, when it dies, does it go to bad, does it go to eight to actual I don't No, I don't think so. It's, oh, it it's, just dies. It's just, yeah, it's just a, basically a box that holds 9-volt batteries that powers cool. your, yeah. your fuzz pedal. So it like solves the problem of, you know, for a guy like me that's, you know, I don't want to have to always be worried about my pedals dying like in the middle of a show. Yeah. So yeah, you don't have to take the it, bottoms off. You don't have to, you can just right. leave the pedal there and they just yeah, exactly. externally. Yeah, exactly. that's a good idea. So that's, that's a, a thing that I think is a really great idea um, that I don't think very many people know about. Yeah, that's a, that's a great one, yeah. What's another a sleeper thing that you have, Red, or something, even, even something new that you like? Um, well, new as far as pedals go, I'm really, I just got an Eventide H9 Max, and I gotta tell you, man, you know, I use a lot of modulation, you know, delays and reverbs and all that kind of stuff, and I have Strymon pedals, which are great, the Timeline and the Big Sky, they're fantastic, but the H9s do everything both of those Strymon pedals do, and more. My brother yeah. swears by it because he got rid Dude. of his Strymon pedal, or yeah. he got rid of one of them anyways. Yeah. He said that that pedal does everything. He you can control it, it with your iPhone or your iPad. It's got MIDI switching capabilities. I mean, it's it really, I think, is kind of sort of the future, not to sound cliche, but it's kind of the future of effects units. And it's, you know, small, low profile footprint, runs off of nine volts. You know, you power it with a normal power supply. Sounds amazing. But aren't they using the algorithms from the H3000 or from some of those? Well, they're tide? using basically it's the H9 Max is every even tied stomp box they make. So it's the time factor, it's the space, it's the mod factor, and the pitch factor all in. But I one think that those are. I would imagine. Yeah, those, yeah they're those from, are the, from the. A lot yeah. of the algorithms are from their rack units, and now they just announced at NAM this year they've got that big H9000 coming yeah. out. So yeah, their rack yeah, mounts yeah. like seven thousand. So the H3000 was the. A piece of gear that you would see in every studio going back to the 80s or so and it was a multi-effects box that would have delays reverbs pitch changes everything it was they were used on a million records people would use them on vocals for for detune they would use them for chorusing for delays everything they're they're um you had to have one if you, you had to have one if every, you were legit you had to have one every studio right SBX had, 90, multi yeah. had multiple had that, ones. right you had to have it yeah, yeah. And I think the thing that Eventide is really nailed with, because I had a time factor delay and the space, and they were good, um, but the thing they've really nailed in the H9 are the converters. The A to D to D to yeah. A converters on the H9 are really, really solid. I mean, they're full on studio grade and a small footprint. And I've seen a lot of guys like, you know, Pete Thorne, I think, on his board has two of them that he uses and, and swaps them out. So. Yeah. Um, I'm really a big fan of that. And then as far as, you know, I was thinking about amps, I have, you know, a couple of nice, really boutique hand wired amps, whatever. But this past week I was in Nashville for rehearsals and I just took my blues junior. I have a blues junior three about 2011 that I modded. I taught myself how to solder on a circuit board. Mm -hmm. I swapped the speaker out. I added a presence knob. I added a three way switch. Didn't with it. Yourself. I didn't kill myself. Uh, which you can do, so don't do that at home. <laughs> yes. Um, but there was a great website, Bill M Mods. So unfortunately, I think Bill M actually passed away like two years ago, brain cancer or something. Mm -hmm. But his site is still active. I think his son still runs it, where it's 
all mods for the Blues Junior yeah. and the Pro Junior, yeah. and they sell them as kits. So mm -hmm. you can do a Tone Stack mod. I mean, you can, you can get crazy and swap it to 6L6s. You can turn them into 30-watt power sections, yep. and it comes with really detailed instructions. And so I modded my Blues Junior, and it will go toe-to-toe -to -toe with my expensive boutique amps now. Yeah. You know, I've, yeah, I think the biggest thing on a, on a Blues Junior mod, uh, if you, you just the, the the transformers is the biggest change. Put a Mercury in it, and a few small cap mods. Yeah, man, you, yeah. I mean, for the money, you can't. I mean, it sounds like a fifteen hundred dollar amp. By the time you get done yeah. putting four new speaker, new yeah. transformer. Yeah. I did a presence knob on mine, yeah. which I think is really those useful. Help. Yeah, those help a lot. Um, and then I added a bias trim pot as well, oh, so yeah. you can you can run the tubes hotter or cooler. But man, I got to tell you. For, especially now because they just came out with the version 4. So you can find a used yeah. version 3 Blues Junior. And mine's built like a tank, man. Yeah. I would literally throw it in the back of my truck and taking turns driving around Atlanta and that thing's rattling around and <laughs> slamming in the back side of yeah. my truck for, God, seven years. And it's never... Dude, those in the down. Pro Juniors, like I said, I still tell people, you know, if you got 500 bucks or less, yeah. that's the amp to buy. It's because you can always fix it. Right. You can get every part ever made for it. You can mod it. You can do all the stuff. It's still small. It's loud enough to play with a yes. drummer. It's just the all-around carry-all, like, okay, bam, it's yeah. there it is. You know? yeah. Okay, so everybody likes things like the Axe Effects and the Kemper mm -hmm. and, and the ease of these things. Because I have a studio, and because I've had, been buying gear for years, I like the real thing, and I have those. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that... An old school pedal that's been reissued for years and years that I have is an old MXR flanger, except I bought this. My mom bought it for me <laughs> in 1978. Okay, it's, and it actually has a hardwired cable to it. Now, this particular one, it probably weighs about five pounds more than the, the Dunlop reissue or whoever <laughs> reissued it. And it sounds a billion times better. There's no comparison, but there's nope. actually a setting on it that I use that every time I did it, used it on a recording, people think, where did you get that Leslie from? And it, this thing does a sound. It'll do the Eddie Van Halen flange sound. Unchained, man. Yeah, an unchained. unchained. Yeah. But it also can sound exactly like a Leslie. And I have one sitting about four feet from us right here. Uh, but this is a great, great pedal. And you can find them used on reefer for probably 250. And I think you have to realize with those, some of them have old chips in them. When those chips go bad, you have to replace them, changes the tone. So if you can find one that hasn't been boogered with. Uh, My brother has one that he doesn't use. So the, typically the guys bad. that have those that are, are usually in great shape is uh, Analog Man usually has a pretty good supply of those. Um, and speaking of flange, my other favorite pedal, sleeper pedal, was the ADA version of this mm. in the late 70s, early 80s. And what it was was the one that Pat Travers used on everything. Pat Thorell and Pat Travers both used both two of them yeah. while they played together and had all of them on at the same time. <laughs> but the way I got hip to them was I was a huge Ty Tabor fan in the mid-late 80s when I first heard him and I went to see him early at a show and he used to play the lab series amps and he had yeah. all of his stuff where he would black everything out because he didn't want anybody to know what it was well he had an ada flanger on the floor and i knew what it was because it was a uh Pat well they Travers also they don't also don't look they're they're really odd looking they're strange like but he had he had painted his completely black so you couldn't really okay. tell what it was <laughs> and i'm looking right at it and i'm going that's the, that's the old ada flanger well what i realized was he wasn't using it as a flanger he was simply using it as a filter, and what he would do, he would take the sweep control, and on those, you could actually take the sweep and stop it. So it was almost like a half cock walk. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, he would take this ADA and stop it at a certain point, and I'll tell you, if you're trying to get that early King's accent, you have to have that pedal, because it's it's part of that whole chain. Now, when he was and, using the Lab Series, was yeah. he the L5? Is that the yeah. one? Was it 212 mm -hmm. or the 410? Cause they had well, both. he cut them into heads, so he was okay. using them with 412 caps. Okay. Originally, they were like 115 and 212. Yeah, and, I yeah. think I think they made I think they made head versions of those, They did. Too. Um, yeah, I used to see uh, uh, Ronnie Montrose. Used but that was actually one. Norland or Gibson, yeah, it was Gibson, right? Yeah, it was Moog. That's actually who, who designed yeah. those. And they had a built-in compressor, I had one which the compressor is a big part of that amp. Yes, yeah. compressor sounded completely yeah. cool and yeah. very weird it was very strange and, and the way ty used them was really bizarre i mean his whole rig was bizarre but the ada 
late 70s block style flanger that they had was you could stop the sweep on it and get these killer tones out of it. And it, it, I never used it for a flange. I just always used it for that one setting yeah. um, and then realized later on that, that actually other guys were using it too. But um, then I have since reissued the ADA and it's really close. So if I was going to pull the trigger, I'd just get a reissue because it's basic, basically the same thing. Okay, one of the greatest deals that I've ever had uh, that I've ever found was an amplifier, once again, that Dave told me about, which is sitting right behind me. It's a Sovtech MiG 100H. It is a 100 watt, basically a, like a modded JCM 800, right, Dave? But it's got um, it's got six L sixes. It's, it's not really an 800. It's it's kind of a it's a high gain. It's amp. kind of a JMP, which okay. is a little bit different than an 800. But this has got 5881s in it, which are the short, stubby, um, super reliable 6L6s. This has one of the best tone controls yeah. of any, way yeah. better than any Marshall. Yeah. That's my favorite amp in the studio. Four, 450 bucks I bought it for, maybe 400 bucks yeah. years ago. And these are, uh, these are now 750, okay. which is still a deal. Uh, people don't know, Softec had a lot of different amps. They had the small box one too that was they a They had a small 50 watt version, which was basically a, a blackface basement, yeah. uh, tweed basement kind of knockoff, which those amps are great too. Yeah. They don't have any kind of uh, masters on them. You have to run those flat up or put pedals in front of them, but they're killer. Um, they made a 60, which is not really that great of an amp. Um, then they had the MiG 100, which was the first series of this, which had less gain. The one this is, is the H version, which yeah. is the hot version, and this yeah. is really the best one for, for that kind of tone. Um, the thing I love about this amp is I used this amp for six or seven years solid. And I mean, really toured the crap out of it. Never had a problem with it. The only thing I had to do was fix the plastic input jacks that yes. were on it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Replace those. That's the only thing I changed uh, on Did it. we replace these? Or these no, these plastic? are stock. These are stock. Yeah. Um, sometimes I've done nothing to it to this yeah. amp. I don't know if I've ever even had it. I think it's retubed. Too. And this is actually a '94. Um, and this is uh, I don't know if you can see it on this camera, but the <laughs> the transformers in this amp are absolutely massive. Yeah, they're huge. And that's the whole thing with this amp. It has a ton of headroom in it, and so it, that's why it's got so, the 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 low end in this amp is so amazing and so warm sounding is that it, those those transformers are huge and they're made in Russia. Yeah, and it's all military spec stuff. You open one of these up, the 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 build control on this is like, I mean, it's it's most of them are, <laughs> I would say, close to perfect as far as the way they're designed. Yeah, they have a couple of quirky little designs in them um but uh, as far as an amp for the money though man uh, these are amazing and then there's another amp which i still have one it's called a red bear mk120 oh, yeah. right it's similar to the similar amp, to that yeah except it's more um uh it actually has more of like the fu manchu heavy heavy like stoner stoner rock yeah. fuzz to it but i you can mod them easily and make them totally into like the ultimate JC made 100 basically which is what I've done with mine and it's a couple of they're, track changes they're a little bit di more difficult to find though aren't they yeah but they're more sleeper you can find those yeah. for three four hundred bucks yeah and I mean I bought mine and they're ugly they got like gray carpeting yeah color. They're, they're so ugly that you know you love them because they are so hideous yeah and the one I had I actually retolexed in red Tolex just to make because it was a red bear because <laughs> I'm that I'm, I'm that guy but anyways um <laughs> But, he is that guy. But for the money, man, the Sovtec stuff, and they did reissue, they didn't have, they haven't reissued these, but they did reissue, Electronomox reissued the 50-watt uh, version with the non-master. Right. You buy a new one of those for like 500 bucks. Wow. Killer, same parts, same everything. They sound just alike. And um, just for a go-to, all-purpose studio amp, these are, uh, they're un unbeatable. I mean, how many times have you used this amp? Oh, thousands. It's on everything. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, so, and that's... When you know when I first brought mine over and you heard it, you were like, you were like, okay, well that's just going to replace four Marshalls I have, right. and it does. It's it's just, it's that amp. It's like I can use this for this, 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 this and I don't need all this other, you know. And it loves pedals. Mm -hmm. It's another thing. It takes yeah. pedals really well. But um, the EQ on it is yeah, incredible. EQ, yeah. I mean, when you turn up the bass, it, it really works. it works. <laughs> it's not like a it's not like an old Marshall. Right. And what's cool is if you put them in the middle, they are flat. Yeah. So it's not like it's it's it, it, you know straight up. It is flat. So you start from zero and you can go minus or plus yeah. either way. So it's cool. Um, plus it looks awesome. 
Yeah. Like if I didn't know any better and I just looked at that, I would absolutely think, oh yeah, that came from Russia. <laughs> right. And it did. Yeah. It did. Yeah. <laughs> well, there and, you go. and the best part is these these little stubby 5881s, I literally, when I bought mine, uh, I never replaced the tubes and I would check them every two years, put them on a, on a meter. They didn't move one. Yeah. One I've plus never, or minus. It ever was dead on the entire re, time. I've never retubed this. Yeah, I've you won't it. need to. I've had it you Unless you drop it or something breaks it. Yeah. Those, they're almost impossible to wear out. Yeah. So I tell people all the time, if you want a good alternative to 6L6, get the stubby Sobtech 5881s, the little tiny bottles. They, they're they indestructible. And I know, I can tell you 20, 30 amp guy, boutique amp guys, they're like, those are the best 6L6s you can get for reliability. And, and if you're going to really use them a ton on the road, you'd use those. Yeah. So. Rhett? What else? Man. Um, I had something and now I'm forgetting it. Okay, well, I'm going to jump in here again then. Another amp that I actually do not have that I've owned about 10 of, well, actually maybe 15 between the two different versions, is the old Orange Overdrive 120. Not the orange, not the graphic, not the OR120, but the OD120. They made these, uh, they were master volume. They have the FAC knob on it that is it goes through what a series of... Uh, of Resistors, Dave? Yeah, it's it's like a um, it's almost like kind of like a Veritone on a Gibson. It yeah, has, has seven ton, positions. Seven position, yeah, yeah. And this is if you want that stoner rock sound, that Fu Manchu, or even we'll give you that Queens of the Stone Age, but it's one of the creamiest distortions that you'll yeah, ever hear. Kind of guys, yeah. uh, they actually reissued it. Somebody bought the orange name in the early nineties. They is reissued it. Their reissues are good from the early nineties. Only for about a year or so they, they made were, them. Um, yeah, those were those were killer, and they were it, what it, who it was was Trace Elliott basically. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So those those are great great Sold amps. Gibson. They're very hard to find. They actually made an o, o, um, over orange overdrive. They go by also yeah. uh, is the other name, and they made a version two of it, which sounded killer as well. But they're not easy to find, and I love the the. The OR 120s are really killer amps, and I've owned between the two of them probably 15 of them or so. I think for me, my favorite amp that I own currently or have owned is uh, divided by 13. It's FTR 37, and the thing I like about it is a the build quality. I mean, the thing's built like a tank, but tonally, it's not. You know, one thing that you find a lot in the boutique world, guitars and amps and pedals, is everybody's sort of kind of going after a Fender or after a Gibson or after a Marshall or a Vox or whatever. And the FTR, like, lives in its own space. It doesn't sound like a Tweed Twin or a, a Deluxe, and it doesn't sound like a Marshall. It doesn't sound like a Vox. It's a really unique voice, which is what brought me to that amp originally. And... The other thing is they've been making them. Fred has been building those amps for a long time. Yeah, yeah long time. Eight, eighteen years, I want to say. Yeah. So, um, and they, I think, to my knowledge, have stayed pretty much the same through the entire production run. So you can find those things used if they've, you know, is even if they're not in good cosmetic shape, the build quality on those things. It's like that soft tech. You open up the yeah. chassis, that FTR, and it's immaculate. Yeah. So. You know, I, I would, the downside with that amp is the size and the weight. I have mine. That's the downside with every amp. Well, that's true. <laughs> Except the Blues Junior. Uh, yeah. Or, or the Gibson. Yeah. yeah. yeah right. um, or, but yeah, like I have a road case for mine and the head just alone in the road case is probably 80 pounds, 85 pounds. Oh, yeah. uh, you Easily, know. Yeah. And then I have the 212 cab and it's got two different speakers in it. It's got a green back and an Alnico blue and it's not easy to move but yeah god it sounds good sounds well that's what you have roadies for yeah well not yet we want to know what your desert island gear is in the comments section below tell us if there's things that are off the beaten track that you've come across that are really amazing sounding and thanks for watching don't forget to subscribe to Rhett's youtube channel Rhett, what is it youtube.com slash rough link in the description and dave uh, subscribe to his Facebook page if you can, if there's space still. Yeah. yeah sure. And one of these days we're going to get Dave to get a YouTube channel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When, when I'm not busy repairing 15 guitars we're working on in it. a day. Yes. No, I, we're I, working yes, on it. Yes. Thanks for watching.